In this clip, we see B-17 bombers attacking the German city of Cologne on May 28, 1944, with specially designed wing glide bombs. These bombs will glide around 20 miles to the target after release. They were intended to strike the side of the target rather than through the roof. The intent of this video is to review the development characteristics, advantages and disadvantages, and combat deployment case study review of the U.S.-developed GB-1 glide bomb. Prior to entering the war, General Hap Arnold visited the UK to review bombing results and effectiveness as discussed on this page from a 1992 Maxwell Air Force Base School of Advanced Air Power Studies document. Bomb plot showed a portion of the bomb striking in open areas, not causing any damage. He reasoned if the bomb's trajectory was flatter, it would be more likely to strike the side of a building. There should be more target contact strikes as the bomb glides in. The general directed work to start on a glide-type bomb for the destruction of urban industrial areas. Various types of controllable, sensor seekers, and power bombs were developed during World War II. The U.S. developed over a dozen types of glide bombs during World War II, as discussed in this 1946 AAF Scientific Advisory Group document. They all use a 2,000-pound general-purpose bomb as a warhead, except for the Model GT-1, which was an aerial glided torpedo. This image shows the size of a 2,000-pound general-purpose bomb. The GT-1 torpedo is shaded here, 12-foot airfoil wing, and its twin boom tail. Another view of the GT-1 torpedo attached to a bomber. The GB-1 incorporates a 12-foot wooden wing and a two-boom tail design. The features are seen in this image. The bomb is connected to the glide frame by two support straps. An autopilot system will keep the bomb on course. The elevator is factory preset fixed to give the maximum glide distance. This equates to a glide angle of 9.5 degrees. The elevator is shaded here. The GB-1 will not be remote controlled or have any homing sensor. At a release altitude of 15,000 feet, the bomb will travel around 20 miles until target or ground strike. Estimated errors between 3 to 5,000 feet in range and 700 to 1,000 feet in azimuth. The resultant probable error is 4,100 feet. For reference, mission failure occurs if less than 5% of the bomb strike within 1,000 feet of the aim point, as discussed on this definitions page from a 1947 United States Strategic Bombing Survey report titled Bombing Accuracy, USAAS heavy and medium bombers ETO. A gross error occurs if the bomb's circular strike pattern is outside of 3,000 feet from the aim point. This implies the GB-1 glide bombs are inaccurate enough to be classified as area weapons, not precision weapons. Some of the other glide bombs with guidance systems are located here. They are either remote controlled or have a target homing sensor, homing TV, homing thermal, radio control, homing light, homing radar. This page ranks the U.S. Air Force's controlled missile program based on priority from a 1943 Army Air Force Board document titled Controlled Missiles. The GB-1 glide bombs are priority number one, then Azons, controlled glide, TV-controlled, and power-driven bombs. Additional characteristics of the GB-1 glide bomb are listed on this page. The glider kit is mounted on a standard 2,000-pound general-purpose bomb. A gyroscopic guidance system stabilizes the bomb in roll and yaw and keeps it flying on a straight course. The bomb is controlled and rolled by aileron shaded here and yaw by rudders from this 1944 GB-5 test report. Another view of the bomb's ailerons and rudder control surfaces. The wing airfoil is symmetrical, which implies the glide lift is by angle of attack. The bomb descends around 1,000 feet in altitude for every one mile in horizontal travel. A B-17 can carry two GB-1 bombs on its external racks. This image shows the glide bombs attached to the B-17's external racks. The bomb is aimed visually by the plane's Norton bomb site. Since the bomb's duration of flight can be up to eight minutes, bomb strike accuracy is very sensitive to the wind, and this has to be accounted for at release. These bombs can only attack large area targets. The main benefit of the glide bombs is they will be released 20 miles from the aim point, which is well outside the range of the target's defensive flak guns. This map from a 1945 AAF Evaluation Board document shows the location of the 282 heavy flak guns surrounding the German city of Munich as of November 26, 1944. A 20-mile GB-1 release ring is represented by this dotted line. The GB-1s can be safely deployed without flak gun bomber attack. Reliability is good, but accuracy is poor. GB-1 is the first of many promising glide bombs. Future glide bombs will be remote controlled or have homing sensors, which will increase their accuracy to acceptable levels.
Another reason to gain glide bomb experience is listed in this November 1943 memo. The Germans may deploy chemical sprayers attached to gliders. The U.S. should develop glide bomb sprayers that, for safety, could be deployed from a standoff position. This program was a GB-11. The B-17's fuel consumption will increase and both max altitude and speed will decrease. Formation cruise speed will drop 10 to 15 miles per hour. A GB-1 equipped B-17's combat radius is 550 miles. Due to the bomb's high wing loading, its stall speed is 175 miles per hour. The bomber should release a bomb at speeds greater than 185 miles per hour, or the bomb's stabilizing system does not have sufficient authority to recover the out-of-control bomb. Once in free glide flight, the bomb's speed will be a constant 240 miles per hour to target contact. The first GB-1 mission occurred on May 28, 1944. The target was Cologne, Germany, as identified on this map representing the state of Reich-occupied territories as of May 1944 from a 1945 Atlas of World Battlefronts and Semi-Monthly Phases. This table lists various German cities as bombing targets. Cologne has a population of 772,000, is 290 miles from 8th Air Force bomber bases, which is well within the B-17's effective combat range of 550 miles, has a burnable ancient city center and war critical industries. A summary of the May 28th mission is listed on this first bombardment report. The target was a city center cathedral as shown in these post-war images. Note that the target is not listed as a military industrial aim point, just kind of in the middle of the city center with the cathedral as an aiming point. This is clearly an area bombing mission. 59 B-17s took off, each carrying two GB-1 glide bombs. One aborted, none were lost. No flak or enemy aircraft attacked the formations. P-47s and P-38s provided bomber escort. 28 bombs of the 115 released spun out of control and their autopilot system was unable to stabilize them. This is likely due to either prop wash or misalignment due to repeated mounting and unmounting. This clip shows a bomb in an uncontrolled spin. 44 of the 115 bombs fell within 3.5 miles of the cathedral. 15 bombs fell 17 miles from the city center. The bombs were released at an altitude between 17,600 and 19,300 feet at an indicated airspeed of 195 to 198 miles per hour, as shown in this June 12, 1944 mission summary document. The time of fall varied between 6 to 8 minutes, and the bombs traveled between 22 and 23 miles. Observations of the mission included, while glide bombing avoids flak, there's a greater fighter threat, and bomb strike results are the worst type of area bombing. Better results occur during precision high-altitude bombing. Glide bombing should be discontinued in the European theater. The 8th Air Force issued a more comprehensive combat experience and recommendation memo dated June 5, 1944. This document evaluated the performance of the GB-1s in combat during the Cologne mission by outlining six reasons why the bomb should not be deployed again. Bomb load is reduced by two-thirds had conventional bombs been used. A large reduction in strike accuracy. Gross bombing errors expected are not consistent with 8th Air Force's precision bombing policy. Bomber range is reduced. Mission prep is longer due to fiddling with the bomb's gyroscopic system. More fighter escorts are required due to flying in a looser formation. Although there's less flak over the target, the flak expected to and from the target is greater due to the bomber's flying speed at slower speeds, lower altitudes, and being less maneuverable. The 8th Air Forces has 910 G1 kits in inventory. These may be used in future missions, but don't send any more glide bomb kits. This teletype message dated December 17, 1944, five months after the Cologne mission, is a sad post-mortem of the GB-1 program. The GB-1 wing kits are stored outside, some exposed to the elements, and are in bad shape. Headquarters may want to salvage and deploy these bombs into other theaters. The 8th Air Forces flew only one glide bomb mission and it was not successful. Many of the B-17's external racks are no longer in inventory. Three months ago, only 16 B-17's, which were wired for GB bombs, were in operational use. The U.S. developed 15 types of glide bombs during World War II. Only three were deployed in combat, the GB-1, GB-4, and the GT-1 torpedo. None performed as expected. If you found this glide bomb deep dive review interesting and informative, please consider supporting the channel by commenting, liking, and or subscribing to World War II U.S. Bombers.